Every task you do in life, every action you take, is in some part mediated by motivation. How motivated are you to do the action or to do the task? And it's likely that some of that motivation comes at least in part from how much you think you'll be rewarded for doing that task. Or conversely, it might also be influenced by you not being punished, not experiencing pain, or some other kind of aversive state. In this level three advanced video, we will be talking about the neurotransmitter dopamine, how it is involved in motivation and reward through something called prediction error signaling, and how all of that works at the level of brain networks. If you want an introduction to dopamine, its relation to schizophrenia, and with a special emphasis on the two different types of dopamine uh, receptors, check out the previous video in this series on those topics. Now, that being said, uh, this current video is part of a mini series on dopamine, which is actually part of a larger ongoing series on an introduction to neuroscience. But in this dopamine mini series, we'll be talking about this neurotransmitter dopamine and the various systems that it's involved with. We started out, as I said, in the last set of videos, talking about the two different families of receptors that bind to dopamine and uh, their relation to schizophrenia. So if you're interested, check that out. I also give a little bit of an introduction to the molecule dopamine. So um, that would be good to watch before this video. However, it's not completely essential. Um, now, this video is going to be talking about, as I said, reward and motivation. And in the next couple of videos, uh, we, maybe one more video, maybe two more, um, and we may be, we'll be talking about addiction um, and as well as movement, because these are two areas in which dopamine is essential. So um, anyway, uh, if you're interested in any of that, uh, definitely check out our videos on dopamine. Now, as I said, this is part of a larger ongoing introduction to neuroscience series. We started out talking about the individual neuron, and then we moved up to um, how a neuron fires, how neurons become connected through synapses. Uh, we also talked about the a uh, couple other neurotransmitter systems, um, namely glutamate and GABA, and now we're moving on to dopamine. Uh, so we'll be talking about more neurotransmitter systems, and we'll be moving up and talking about brain systems, behavior. Um, so now that we've kind of reached the neurotransmitter system um, point in this series, we won't be talking so much about molecular biology, we'll be talking more about brain systems and behavior. Now with every topic in the Introduction to Neuroscience series, uh, we will have three different levels of difficulty and length. So we'll have a uh, level one beginner, which is basically just a 30 to 60 second kind of uh, overview summary of the main points of the topic that we're covering. Um, then we'll have a level two intermediate difficulty, and it will also be intermediate in length. It'll be about 10 to 20 minutes. And that will be more about um, giving you a little more detail, but not getting too technical, avoiding some of the kind of nuances. And we will have a level three, longer, more advanced video, uh, which will go more into depth and it may cover more topics within uh, the, the topic that we're covering. All right, so without further ado, let's get back to dopamine motivation and reward. By the way, I'm Andrew and this is Sense of Mind. This channel is all about giving you the tools so that you can understand your brain, um, upgrade your mind and improve your life. So we're all about doing both videos like this and this, this series on neuroscience, which is kind of giving you fundamental science uh, knowledge about how the brain works and how the mind works. And we also talk about topics like um, mental health and critical thinking. So all around trying to give you an understanding of your brain and mind and how to improve it. So if you don't wanna miss any future videos or anything, um, make sure to subscribe if you're on YouTube or follow if you're on Instagram. Definitely like this video if you get anything out of it and throw me a comment below if you have any thoughts. I'm interested in what you have to say. And uh, if you feel like it, please share this video with anybody who you think would benefit. 
Finally, uh, we are finally launching our newsletter. So this newsletter is going to have exclusive content. We're gonna have um, early access to content and uh, that will be for newsletter subscribers only. So definitely check that out. The link is in my bio if you're on Instagram or in the caption uh, below this video on YouTube. So thank you so much for watching. Let's get into it. Okay, so before we get into all this, let's do some definitions. Um, so what is motivation, or better yet, what is a motivational state? So a motivational state is a kind of brain state or, or cognitive state that either um, leads an animal to uh, seek a reward or to avoid some kind of um, pain or otherwise aversive stimuli. So motivational states come about due to both internal and external factors. Internal factors would be things like um, the state of the body, physiology, uh, if there's you know, perhaps stress hormones floating around, if um, you know, the, the body is experiencing pain, or if it's hot or cold, um, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, uh, tired, these are all um, kind of internal bodily slash cognitive states. And then it's also, of course, influenced by external stimuli. So um, this is kind of more what we think of when we think of reward and punishment, um, because you know, uh, if you're motivated to seek a reward, it's you know probably because there's something in your environment that would be rewarding if you were to get it. So you know, you see a a cookie on the counter and. Uh, you're suddenly motivated to get up, walk over, pick up that cookie and eat it. Um, so that might be um, an interplay between internal uh, physiological and cognitive factors, you know, such as your hunger, um, you know, your level of, uh, of willpower to keep yourself from breaking your diet, and as well as, uh, of course, the external stimuli being the cookie itself sitting there. Um, so there's a lot going on, but anyway, uh, I hope that clarifies what a motivational state is. All right, and this may be obvious, but let's just define what a reward is. So in um, neuroscience and psychology, a reward is typically any kind of desirable object or action or other kind of stimuli, um, and it, it typically drives approach behavior. So typically drives animals, including us humans, to approach the object or, or do the action or um, get closer to the stimuli. Um, and now these can be both short-term, like I was just talking about with the cookie being a, a short-term reward for getting up, walking over. Um, and it can be also you know, very long-term. Like when we think about uh, completing a project, a long-term project at work, or you know, getting a, a promotion or moving up in some way that requires kind of a long sequence of actions uh, with this end goal, this, this reward far in the future. All of this, I want you to keep in mind throughout what we're talking about that while we'll be talking about people and um, things that humans do, this is a system that is very important for you know, all animals, it is especially for mammals, and um, we will see that throughout. So um, let's, let's get back into this. So some of the important brain regions um, that are involved in reward and motivation are the nucleus accumbens, the ventral pallidum, the um, olfactory tubercle, the um, ventral striatum, the ventral tegmental area, and then there's other important areas that aren't strictly speaking part of this reward and motivation network, but are um, heavily involved in these processes, um, including the thalamus, the cortex, especially the prefrontal cortex, as well as the hippocampus and the amygdala. So um, there's a lot of brain regions involved, and we are gonna be mainly focusing on those first ones that I mentioned, especially the nucleus accumbens. Okay. So there is kind of a common misconception out there that dopamine is all about pleasure, that it just causes pleasure in the brain. And that is not true. Now, it's true that dopamine is highly involved in the processes that eventually um, bring pleasure to conscious awareness. That is, um, it is involved 
in the generation of pleasure that you eventually perceive and feel, right? But um, dopamine is not um, causing pleasure wherever it goes, if, if that makes sense. Dopamine is involved in a lot of other functions other than just pleasure. And in fact, it's thought that dopamine is more involved in something called prediction error signaling. And so this actually characterizes dopamine's relationship to reward a lot better than if it were simply coding for pleasure. So I know that was kind of a lot, but let's look at how that works. We're gonna break it down step by step and think about this. All right, so what we've got pictured here is a brain, your brain, and um, there are a, a number of regions highlighted. And so you can see the nucleus accumbens, the olfactory tubercle, the ventral pallidum. I could have probably also included the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra and um, some others. But um, regardless, it is this sort of area of the brain where we find um, these regions that are highly involved in motivation and reward. I wanna talk about how prediction error signaling works. So what you're seeing here is on the left, we have um, an electrode uh, placed into this area of the brain, this sort of reward network, this reward system of the brain. And we're recording activity from dopaminergic neurons. So that means that when these neurons fire, when dopamine utilizing neurons fire, uh, we are going to see um, activity and we're going to be able to record that and see it on the screen. So what you're seeing on the right is that activity. It's just a kind of baseline. This is what's called uh, the tonic dopamine um, release. It's, dopamine is sort of just being constantly released at a, a baseline rate. And um, that is what we're gonna be looking at, is the rate of firing of these neurons um, so kind of how much dopamine is being released, how much activity is going on in these regions as far as dopamine is concerned. Okay, so now what happens? Let's think about what if you get an unexpected reward? What does that do? Okay, well, you get this unexpected reward and boom, you get a spike in dopaminergic activity. You get a spike in these dopamine neurons firing. Their firing rate increases in response to that unexpected reward. And so by right now, you're probably thinking, well, that really seems like dopamine is coding for pleasure. I mean, after all, it, it happened right when you got the reward. You know, what, what else would you expect from something that is, you know, showing, you know, when you experience pleasure? Well, here's why, uh, here's one reason why scientists don't believe that that is the main function of dopamine here. So you have this unexpected reward. Let's say that this um, is a, a friend walking up to you out of the blue and giving you a cookie, right? And um, this friend just, you know, didn't say anything about it before, brings you a cookie and, oh, that's so nice. You know, you get that little, that blip of dopamine activity, right? That burst, um, okay. But let's say your friend does this for you know a few days and you start getting used to this routine. This friend is a great friend, right? They're coming every single day, bringing you a cookie, and you come to expect that. And in fact, what happens in your brain is when you see that friend and you know, oh, okay, they're bringing the cookie. Uh, you see that and that's when the dopamine burst happens. So that's what we're seeing in this image is the cue is your friend walking up to you with that cookie. You get that blip, that big spike of dopamine, and then, um, and then the firing goes back down to the baseline, even when you get the reward. So I said that dopamine is all about um, prediction error signaling. So what does that mean? Well, right here in this image, you are making a prediction, right? Your brain is predicting by that dopamine um, release or that's, that's what's telling us that it's making a prediction, but your brain is predicting, your reward system is predicting that you are going to receive a reward. So it is releasing dopamine, it's saying, oh, we're about to get a reward in just a second, and you, you get it, right? And it just, things keep going, everything's fine. So what happens if you um, are expecting the reward, right? You, uh, 
you see your friend coming, right? And you're like, ooh, cookie, 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 cookie. You get that, that's the cue, right? So you get that um, burst of dopamine activity, right? But it turns out your friend's out of cookies today and she's upset. Uh, she's, I'm sorry, don't have the cookies. And you're like, damn. And what happens then? Well, at the time when you would normally get the reward, let's say it's, you know, the moment after your friend greets you, she usually gives you the cookie, you take a bite. But this time she greets you, no cookie, right? And then explains what happens, what happened where, where she, she ran out of flour, couldn't make the cookies. But at that moment when you should be eating the cookie and experiencing that delicious chocolatey reward, your dopamine uh, activity goes down. It actually pauses. So there, it's not just that it, it returns to baseline, it actually goes down. And so that is the that is what tells scientists that, okay, there's something going on here with predicting rewards, right? So your brain is predicting that it's going to get a reward, but it doesn't. And instead of just returning to a baseline level of activity, it actually stops that dopamine signaling for just for a little bit, right? And so that is that system, that's that system's way of saying you didn't receive the reward. We had an error in prediction. So that's what we mean by prediction error. Um, so it is signaling the fact that you were wrong about your prediction. Okay, now the last situation um, is, you know, if you had been receiving the reward for a long time, right? Uh, your friend had, this was years, you know, you guys are meeting up, every single day, she's bringing a cookie, you're eating it, and, and this just goes on and on and on and on and on to the point that the cookie is just kind of boring at this point. You're like, all right, you know, I don't even, like I like it, but it's not, it's not that exciting anymore. And what happens then is your brain has completely learned, is com completely habituated to this pattern, and it no longer is even worried about predicting that reward because there's just nothing more to learn about that situation. And that is um, something about dopamine, that it, it is actually really important for learning about rewards and um, punishment, about um, different kinds of stimuli in the environment. Some scientists interpret this as the brain saying, there's nothing more to learn, right? We know this is here. We don't need to be changing dopamine activity. You might still get a little blip um, when you see your friend because that, that prediction is still there and it goes gradually over time. So you probably still get that. But, you know, on the whole, it's it's really old hat. You're, you're used to this now. It's, it's like, you know, when you first started driving a car, Right? It was probably really exciting and novel, and, and it, was, it was fun to do it, uh, to drive to, maybe you were driving to school or something. And then as time goes on, you get years and years and years of commuting and getting in the car. It's like, it's not at all a reward anymore. It's not even fun or exciting. Um, so it, it's kind of, this is, this is one way that we can see how our brains begin to habituate, begin to become really acclimated and used to the kinds of uh, rewards that we usually see in our environment are the kinds of things that we usually encounter. Okay, so this is interesting. This is a fairly recent set of findings in neuroscience, but um, it's interesting because dopamine is not just about approach behavior and um, signaling reward and that sort of thing. It's actually also highly involved in um, aversive stimuli and um, avoidance behavior. So rather than desire, it's also involved in dread, right? And dread being kind of um, the emotion of, of, of avoidance, right? If you want to avoid something, you sort of dread it. This region of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is highly involved in reward, is actually also highly involved in the opposite kind of um, motivational, motivated behavior, namely dread, right? The sorts of behavior that drive us to avoid things, um, to get away from something. And that's interesting because it means that this region is actually involved not just in reward, but in motivational salience, 
um, generally. It's involved in motivation. It's involved in both sides of motivational states. So let me explain a little bit more of how that works. So pictured here um, is a brain, and you're seeing it like if you if you cut it in half, if you kind of <laughs> cut your head in half at your eyes and <laughs> went to the back of your head. I'm sorry for that morbid image, but that's what you're seeing, the underside of that. And uh, so at the top is the back of the brain, and at the front is the um, front of, or at the bottom is the front of the brain. So what you're seeing highlighted in these colors are the, uh, the nucleus accumbens and the, the different areas of it. So um, in the yellow and blue, or the sort of bottom half of each of the highlighted regions, is the nucleus accumbens shell. Right, and interestingly. If you stimulate the front area of the nucleus accumbens shell, so the area uh, closer to the bottom in this image, what you get is the animal does behaviors that look like approach type behaviors. So um, wanting to eat lots, wanting to have sex, wanting to, um, which is it generally it looks like it's in an approach type of mindset, trying to, um, you know, do things. <laughs> and, but if you stimulate the, the back area, the kind of in this image, the upper area of the nucleus accumbens shell, not, not to the core, right, but just the, the sort of back half of that shell area, what you get is aversive type behavior. You get a rat or a mouse that, that is really freaked out, that wants to bite anybody that's coming near it, even if it's normally a tame rat, it wants to run away, it wants to escape. So that's why Barrage and Kringlebach have referred to it as an emotional keyboard, because tapping keys in the front uh, elicits approach behavior. Tapping keys in the back elicits aversive behavior. Now you're probably asking yourself, what about in the middle? What about between the front and back? Well, what you get there depends on the context. So if you stimulate that middle area and you've got a really stressed out rat, like you've got, literally they had experiments where they were playing punk rock music and just like had a crazy environment, that rat will show aversive behavior. If you have a really calm environment where it's in its home cage and it's with its, its relaxing partners and it's in a, in a place where rats generally like to be, then what you get is approach type behavior. So it's context dependent. And another interesting little fact about this is re relating to our video when we talked about the different dopamine receptors, the different families, the D1 and D2 family receptors, where D1 is largely excitatory and D2 is largely inhibitory. Um, what we see is that the approach behavior depends only on D1 uh, uh, neurons with D1 type receptors. So, um, so when you stimulate that uh, frontal area and you get approach behavior, that is only dependent on D1 uh, type receptor dopamine signaling. The aversion, the aversive behavior stimulated uh, when or elicited when you stimulate the back area of the nucleus accumbens shell is mediated by both D1 and D2 receptors. Now, um, that middle region, I don't think it's so clear about what's going on there, but it is interesting to see that these different types of receptors, uh, this kind of molecular biology can correlate with behavior in an interesting way. Okay, so let's now look at kind of a, a tentative, simplified model of how this sort of uh, motivation and um, this motivated behavior works in this system. Um, and I, I just want to really emphasize, I don't want you to get confused in thinking that the model that I present is exactly what's going on with the brain, that this is the definitive model. There are um, other ideas about how this works, um, but this is a good start and it will allow you to see the kinds of things that are going on and that are likely to be going on when we're talking about uh, reward and um, motivated behavior. Okay, so let's just go through this and uh, we'll just walk through it step by step. Okay, so first, you are anticipating some food 
or drug or sex or winning a game, some kind of reward. So basically, that anticipation, that that recognition of a reward is about to happen, your friend's going to bring you that cookie, you get um, activation of multiple regions within the reward system. And this gets a little bit fuzzy about what exactly is going on, what happens first, uh, but reward or the anticipation of reward causes release of dopamine in both the nucleus accumbens and the olfactory tubercle. So one of the things that the nucleus accumbens is doing is it is projecting to the ventral pallidum and it is inhibiting the activity of the ventral pallidum. It is telling it, shut up, don't talk right now, we don't need to hear you. Okay. And it is also activating the ventral tegmental area. That's not quite so relevant for what we're thinking about but it inhibits this ventral pallidum, okay? And um, the olfactory tubercle also does the same thing. And it, uh, it only projects to the ventral pallidum. Just to be sure, um, when you stimulate the olfactory tubercle, it, has, it, it causes um, um, approach behavior just like the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so... Understanding this network a little bit further, um, in the absence of reward, in the absence in just normal situations when the ventral pallidum is active to some extent, one thing that it's doing uh, that is shown by this white line is that it is inhibiting the activity of certain um, circuits within the thalamus. And the thalamus is often called the sensory relay station. So it is kind of this area where um, information from the senses is integrated and then sent to different parts of the brain. And it also receives information from the cortex, from the areas of the brain that process sensory information and um, can send it to the body. And it can it, it is just a very important um, central way station for sensory information and for transmitting information from these subcortical brain regions to the cortex. And the cortex is really involved in kind of higher processing, in planning behavior, in sensation, in perception. So it is kind of the boss when it comes to what you actually do as far as um, you know movement, you know, walking across the room to pick up that cookie, uh, walking, you know, being motivated to do anything is going to happen um, mostly in the cortex as far as the planning and the actual execution of those movements goes. That's where the plan starts. So, so just keep that in mind. So what this ventral pallidum is usually inhibiting the activity of um, certain uh, circuits within the thalamus. Let's think about this, right? You're anticipating reward, and so you get uh, activation of the nucleus accumbens and olfactory tubercle, and that inhibits the ventral pallidum, right? And, okay, well, the ventral pallidum, right, is usually inhibiting the thalamus, um, and, and another way that the ventral pallidum becomes inhibited is through the ventral tegmental area and actually the, the substantia nigra um, project through various regions of the, the striatum, which is kind of that, uh, that red structure part of it, at least. And all of this, right, just like we saw before, is causing the ventral pallidum to be inhibited. And if we think again, right, what is the ventral pallidum usually doing? It is usually inhibiting the activity of the thalamus, those thalamocortical circuits, right? The, the circuits that go from the thalamus to the cortex. So what is going to happen, right? Well, that thalamus is going to light up. It's going to turn on. It's no, it releases the brakes, right? It's not um, inhibited by the ventral pallidum anymore. So what is the thalamus going to do? It is going to send signals to the cortex, right? And this is where things get really interesting. So these cortical projections from the thalamus allow the brain to interpret the signals and decide on a course of action and follow it, right? So if you're a hungry animal, right? You're walking around your environment looking for food. Ooh, a cookie. You, you, uh, you decide to go to there, right? And you get an increase in, um, in dopamine 
which goes through the pathways that we just talked about, right? Ending at the thalamus, and then the thalamus mediates uh, between the cortex and the basal ganglia in order to initiate, coordinate, and direct movement toward or away from the fridge. So this is all about goal-directed behavior, and um, and right. So it it that thalamus uh, mediates between the cortex, kind of planning these movements, and then that will come back in a reciprocal connection back to the uh, basal ganglia, that red, red structure. And um, this will coordinate through the brainstem and through the peripheral nerves in the body uh, that cause you to get up and go pick up that cookie. So another interesting thing that happens is uh, the thalamus also projects to uh, regions like the amygdala and um, the prefrontal cortex. And this is important uh, because uh, the PFC, the amygdala, and the ventral striatum, um, all areas that are projected to by the thalamus, are all important for affect, for you know, positive and negative feelings. And finally, right, the ventral striatum is stimulated, and this process can repeat in a loop uh, because it, in turn, can stimulate the nucleus accumbens, right, until you're no longer hungry, the food runs out, something else lowers um, the amount of signaling going on in these networks. Okay, so that is definitely a simplified version of what is going on, but it gives you a sense of like how these things become connected, right, because it can seem very abstract when we're just talking about regions in the, the you know, the reward regions, but how does that talk to the cortex? How does that initiate movement? How does that get you to go do the thing that's going to give you the reward? So I just want to emphasize again that this is simplified and this model is likely on on various points not completely correct. It could be overturned. And I just wanted to present it as a way for you to understand how these networks might be instantiating reward and motivation and eventually movement. So um, again, just take it with a grain of salt, but everything leading up to this point uh, is a lot more robust. It's just that this particular model is not you know, fully agreed upon within the neuroscientific community. Anyway, I hope that that cleared up how dopamine is involved in reward and motivation. And we're going to get even deeper into this kind of stuff when we talk about addiction, um, drugs of abuse like cocaine and um, amphetamines, as well as you know, opioids like morphine. We'll be getting into how those are related to the system that we just talked about, how addiction occurs. And this will lead us to talking about you know, behavioral addictions, um, this will really allow you to understand um, a lot more about human behavior and how the brain mediates it. So I really hope that you got something out of this. And if you did, please throw this video a like. If you have any questions or comments, or you notice I got anything wrong, which is possible, uh, give me a comment below. I'm, I'm really excited to keep this conversation going. Thank you so much for watching. Um, again, please make sure to subscribe if you're on YouTube or follow if you're on Instagram and share this if you, uh, if you know anybody who you think might get anything out of it. And uh, finally, thank you so much for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This video was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.